Welcome to SVG TV News for Wednesday, July 20th, 2016. I'm Lafren Fraser with the details. The Chamber of Industry and Commerce is recognized as the body which represents the private sector. This was the comment of Anthony Regisford, the Executive Director of the Chamber, as he spoke with SVG TV News on matters relating to the organization. Regisford revealed that the Chamber of Industry and Commerce aims at supporting the private sector, facilitating growth, and ensuring that a good business environment exists. Regisford pointed out that as part of achieving these objectives, the Chamber has organized several activities which help create a platform for businesses to network. Um, it's a very, very important role. The Chamber is recognized as the body that represents the private sector to the outside world. And so all these people who want to con make contact with the private sector in St. Vincent, they tend to come through the Chamber, okay? And we in turn will um, disseminate that information and try to link people together. The Chamber provides a, a, a platform where businesses can network, so we have cocktail parties, we have luncheons. They're important because you get together in one place and um, you get to meet people from other companies that may do business with you. Uh, you know, business-to-business -business relationships. Regisford added that his organization was to open to registered business, registered business and pointed out that it is these very members that help guide the direction of the organization. That is basically what it is. The Chamber is a membership organization. The, chambership, the Chamber is not Tony Regisford. It does not belong to me. Belongs to the members. I am the executive director and I'm guided by the membership of the organization. So if you are on the outside, it is very good, it's going to be very difficult. If you're on the outside as a business, it's going to be very difficult for get, to get the chamber to do something for you when you're not on the inside. Because when you are on the inside, you can make that change or you can make that activity happen. It's as simple as that. Okay, so if you're on the team, then you can play a role in achieving the result that the team sets out to achieve. Speaking on the cobblestone issue, Regisford stated that the Chamber is working to get information from both the landlord and the tenant on the issue and therefore is unable to make a comment until he is privy to the full information. Regisford, however, noted that if the operators of Cobblestone Inn were members of the Chamber, more information would have been available to his organization. If person was a member of the Chamber, then we clearly would, would, would have had um, far more information um, provided that person, you know, was sharing it. Um, but I would stress again, that does not mean because, it, because the business is not a member of the chamber. Because if it's something that generally impacts businesses, period, right? So, for example, if you question of fact finding, um, and you may ask, why aren't we in a position to? The, the, the incident happened over the weekend, just prior to the weekend, I believe. Uh, why aren't we in a position to um, make a comment? Um, and it may be a fair question, but we're dealing with a situation where it is a non-member, so we're not armed with preliminary information as if she was on the inside. Opposition leader Arnim Eustace says that he is still struggling to digest the reason given by Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonsalves for the eviction of Cobblestone Inn proprietor and Joshua. Dr. Gonsalves, who on Sunday, July 17th, spoke extensively on the matter during WFM's Issue at Hand program, stated that while Joshua, who is his first cousin, is an NDP supporter, they have always maintained a civil relationship and the decision taken by the National Properties Limited is based solely on transparency and not on politics. But in an exclusive interview with SVG TV's Nolisha Miller, Eustace referred to this claim as utter rubbish. Here's more in this report. That is just sheer party politics and victimization. That's all it is. That is the view of opposition leader Anim Eustace on the eviction of Cobblestone Inn proprietor and Joshua. 
According to reports, Joshua, who has been operating the Cobblestone Inn for some 30 years, received a letter from the National Properties Limited on Wednesday, July 13th, requesting that she vacate the government-owned premises by September 30th. On WFM's Issue at Hand radio program on Sunday, July 17th, Dr. Gonzalez took the time to explain that the decision taken by the government was far from being political and merely was an attempt to not only ensure that the leasing of state properties was completely transparent, but also to allow all interested parties the opportunity to bid for these properties. However, an aggravated user said that he was unwilling to swallow the transparency pill and remained convinced that it was a political maneuver which hinted off victimization. I could understand if you went in a place of money and then a pain, I could understand you making a move. But that's not the case, and Joshua. That is politics, and nasty politics. Eustace said that it is pointless to say the premises will be placed up for tender when not only the hotelier, but the operation's entire staff will be put on the proverbial breadline. She has not to arrange severance for her workers and all sorts of things. You can do that in two and a half months when you're not functioning. She is paying $24,158 a month for cobblestone in, which is $6,000 a week, roughly. Mm -hmm. She's not in a res. She's paid up. NIS is paid up for the hotel. Maintenance is done by her. She doesn't know anything. How all of a sudden you want to close it down? The opposition leader said that the eviction of Cobblestone in preparator will only contribute to the further decline of the country's economy. The one and out of there. That's what it boils down to. And I hope she takes some legal action on the matter. How do you think this is going to, af to affect the economy? It's going to have a negative impact on the economy. It's going to be positive. The people who she buys goods from food, fish, all things, vegetables and so on. The people, a lot of the maintenance is done by, by her in the building. The workers who do all that maintenance and so on. These are people who are going to lose. And her full-time workers will go home. Remember we talking about 30 years, you know. Somebody with you for 30 years. And they close them down in two and a half months and they don't owe you. Come on. Who's going to start talking to? Meantime, the opposition leader voiced his concern over the current state of the economy, adding that he would like to see some improvements in the areas of export, a structured program for the development of the private sector, and while he supports Argyle International Airport, he would like to see some responsible action taken on that project so as to divert what he sees as an impending economic disaster. But Dr. Gonzalez disputed accusations of victimization against the cobblestone proprietor, stating she is not the first person to have received an eviction letter from the government, as telecommunication company Cable & Wireless, presently known as Flo, who received a 20-year lease during the New Democratic Party administration on state property, also received a similar letter. When they were, when they were haggling and don't want to pay the rent, I told them, well, leave my building. And we, in fact, had given them notice to leave. And I just simply put the, um, the, the, the registry there. You can't, they, 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 you have use for the property, you know. But they chose to, they made a business decision to rent it. He further added, the company who had constructed a building on the premises was offered two propositions at the end of the 20-year lease. One. You can buy it, we had a valuation, something around $12 million. Or B, you pay the rental now on the, the land and the building because the building is, not, is now ours. And that property has been transferred to, to the NIS so that we strengthen the NIS there by having and income is 70 something thousand dollars a month rent is being paid for that place. Dr. Gonzalez stated that Flo had however refused both offers from the government and instead chose to occupy the property on a rental basis.
Up to news time, the Prime Minister has stated that the government has no arrangements with anyone to commence business at the cobblestone premises. Nolisha Miller, The Evening News. An appeal is being made for a shake-up within the Carnival Development Corporation and the appointment of Coordinator of Rural Carnival, Ezi Roberts, as Chairman of the Board. This comes as on the heels of the culmination of Vinci Mass 2016, when many persons have openly expressed their disappointment in the organization of the festival's events. However, it is alleged that the CDC Board is likewise disappointed and blames the manner in which arrangements for certain events were handled during the Carnival season. During this year's Vinci Mass, a series of private events were held, some clashing with CDC's events. According to the CDC Act, Article 4, under the Section of Powers and Duties of the Corporation, the Corporation shall have the power to manage, promote, develop, and carry out the Carnival Festival or activity within and outside of the state. Further, Article 6 states, any person who is desirous of holding a Carnival Festival or activity on a day in which an event of the CDC event is scheduled to take place shall not be allowed to do so if the event or activity is deemed by the order of the Carnival Development Corporation to have competing interest with its scheduled events. But a source who prefers anonymity told SVG TV News that protocol was not followed in many instances and the matter was further aggravated when it was discovered by the board that a Barbados rum was being promoted at the E.T. Joshua Airport. It was being given to arriving passengers instead of this country's award-winning rum. SVG TV contacted the St. Vincent Brewery Limited, who indicated that the giveaways at the airport had been one of their many marketing ventures. However, according to Chairman of the CDC, Dennis Ambrose, he nor any member of the board was aware of the marketing venture and the promotion of Mount Gay Rum continued at a private event during the carnival season. Meanwhile, Ambrose has stated that while there have been calls for him to step down, it is a matter for the cabinet to decide. It is expected that a cabinet decision will be concluded by July 31st this year. Efforts made by SVG TV to contact Ezzy Roberts on the matter proved futile. According to agricultural consultant Fillmore Isaacs, in his remarks as a panelist on the Hits Talk radio program on Sunday, July 17, 2016, which highlighted environmental issues and their impacts on the Vincentian environment, especially in the rainy season, Proper management of both our landscape and overall environment are the means of preventing more environmental issues with even greater environmental impacts. Isaacs noted the need for persons to be more responsible for what goes on in their environment as too often persons tend to blame the bigger heads for issues which can be quicker solved among themselves. As of the people, St. Vincent and the Grandians, we are blessed with the rains. We are blessed with a nice landscape. To have these white goods, to have a nice refrigerator and a stove, I love that because it saves a, a lot of the inconveniences of what used to happen. Let us not turn these blessings into curses by our attitude. I want to shift responsibility from us directly to somebody else and blame somebody else. The solid waste unit in CWSA have a regular morning program in the advert. They run programs on TV. So it's not a matter of people not aware, but I'm, you, you said it earlier on. It's time for us to begin to bite. Enforce. We back too much. In Isaacs called for stiffer penalties to be enforced on offenders who illegally dump white goods and said that even certain agencies can take up the responsibility of disposing these items. That's the problem here in St. and Grandines. Some of the violators, we would be afraid because where I see some things being dumped is not poor people because poor people don't have the transportation to dump those things. You have to be people who have transportation to carry them there. So sometimes we say the poor people think, no, 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 not the poor people. And you can't be dumping your old fridge in front of my yard or somebody's yard or in some gutter and feel that is the end of your thing. No, let us begin to be responsible for our goods. Yes, collectively we pay taxes and some other rates, etc., to some institutions which should facilitate that. I agree. And they must take responsibility since we're paying them. They must take some responsibility. 
Isaacs further gave some advice to what he described as simple natural solutions to the issues of riverbank erosion. I would speak to a very natural and what I call low cost, sustainable way to maintain riverbanks. And that is the vetiver grass. I can't cover this program, Connie, mm -hmm. without plugging mm -hmm. for the vetiver grass. Mm -hmm. So that is where I will come back. How do we maintain, or how do we, in a long term, um, we find some solution? I'm not saying all. Vetiver would not be all the answer executing a plan that is geared at the renewal of primary health care should be identified as a priority. That is according to Minister of Health, Wellness and the Environment Luke Brown, who spoke at a press briefing yesterday regarding the prevention of and protection from mosquito-borne diseases such as Zika and yellow fever. Brown also noted that the ministry has devised a plan to recruit youth volunteers to assist in public health work to be done. Are we, in fact, we have the curriculum together already. Uh, a course of in public health education that will equip some young people who are interested. It could be individuals of a sufficient maturity where age is concerned and, uh, and efficiency is concerned to recruiting individuals to, to be trained and to assist us in the dissemination of information brochures. And we want to do this on as wide a tract as possible and as wide a scale as possible and hopefully to cover every household in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. He then added that the plan should commence by the end of the month with the youths having the ability to assist with the dissemination of information and with household inspections as they play an important part in surveillance and integrated vector control and management. What we propose to do essentially is to recruit young people. I think we could probably aim for a group of 300, 500 young people and uh, to train them and to get them going. And we will, we will at a subsequent occasion, present the details, uh, well, all the, all the proposed details in relation to this plan so that we could activate it as soon as possible. We're hoping that we could be up and running in earnest by August. And uh, this is something that it is my dream as Minister of Health uh, to would kickstart the, the rebirth or the renewal of primary health care in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, which would help us to reactivate community health groups or community health committees all over this country. Also speaking at the press briefing yesterday was Chief Medical Officer Simone Kieser Beach, who advised that two cases of the Zika virus among pregnant women have been confirmed in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and the ministry is not only monitoring these pregnancies for abnormalities, but are also providing counseling to the women. Our position has always been to allow for informed decisions, so we would provide everyone with the information, the risk, the lack of risk, um, we'd also let you know about what we have put in place. So, for example, you know we're already um, following two persons who have been Zika, confirmed as Zika positive and preg in pregnancy, and those persons are being followed in terms of counseling, in terms of um, diagnostic studies for ultrasonography to detect, if possible, and then again we have to consider the, the efficacy of the ultrasound to pick up abnormalities. Kieser Beach said that Zika has not only been associated with microcephaly, but also with visual and auditory problems as well. And the policy of the ministry is to have healthcare professionals monitor babies born to women who are tested positive for Zika during pregnancy. The purpose of the monitoring and the testing is to provide support and so that we can, the person can be as psychologically prepared for what is or what might not happen. And um, so we provide um, radiology, um, ultrasound, monitoring, and persons are registered with their obstetricians to be followed throughout the pregnancy. And because of the fact that um, Zika has been associated with not just microcephaly, but also with problems with vision and hearing, the um, policy is that we will continue following the babies born to persons with Zika, confirmed Zika, 
um, because of the possibility. This is a new disease in our region, so we need to follow to see what's happening. So we're not just looking for microcephaly, we're also going to test these children for um, visual problems and hearing problems. The United Nations Development Program, an organization that works in social situations to help improve societies, conducted their first national youth citizen security dialogue in the Eastern Caribbean here in St. Vincent. The focus, which was on issues affecting the youth, afforded attendees the opportunity to discuss social situations they encounter or witness, provide suggestions for addressing these issues, and consider things the state could be responsible for. This dialogue was inspired by the rising amount of youth violence and crime across the Eastern Caribbean. Janine Chase, project coordinator, pointed out that the program was inspired following the UNDP's identification of the various effects and possible causes of these violent acts carried out by the youth. Chase is a firm believer that youth violence and crime can be battled. In our work at UNDP, we have noted a number of, of issues, including youth unemployment, particularly amongst young males, growing poverty and inequality, poor performance in secondary schools, as well as dropout rates varying across countries that we cover, migration rates and family disintegration um, as being primary risk factors contributing towards um, antisocial behavior amongst young people, particularly joining gangs or using violence as a source or as a medium for conflict resolution. We, at UNDP, we have recognized that there are no quick fixes to reducing youth crime and violence. And, however, we believe that the challenges facing our countries can be solved in a sustainable manner through a multi-sectoral, people-centered approach that focuses on prevention and, and empowerment. Minister of National Mobilization Frederick Stevenson, who believes that social security is not only vital to the productivity of Vincentians, but also in the enhancement of investment opportunities and private enterprise growth, Frederick endorsed the Youth Citizen Security Dialogue, stating that it will and in combating youth crime and violence, he added that it was critical that the community and youth themselves do their part in finding resolutions to the issue. As we seek to widen relationships and encourage investments thus providing our nation with jobs and other opportunities, it is imperative that the security of our citizens be seen as a prerequisite to maximize production, investment, and entrepreneurship. The impact of this will affect the youth of the nation, and as such, measures must be put in place to combat crime and violence at the national level. It therefore requires more stringent action to combat crime to which the youth and community must become involved in and, where possible, take the lead. Another exercise conducted by the Regional Security System, the RSS, will conclude this Friday, July 22nd, at the Old Montrose Police Station from 4 p.m. According to a release issued by the Public Relations Department of the Police Force, the RSS basic course trained participants in the basic military skills so that the officers can take their respective places in a section of the Special Service Unit within their respective countries. Participants were exposed to training in areas such as human rights, narcotic interdiction, eradication and prosecution, operations during disasters, and the handling of fire weapons, among other things. 33 participants, inclusive of five females drawn from six of the regional countries, will graduate this Friday from the Regional Security Systems course.